Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, featuring your host, Anna Jaworski. Our program is a program designed to empower the CHD or congenital heart defect community. Our program may also help families who have children who are chronically ill by bringing information and encouragement to you in order to become an advocate for your community. Now, here is Anna Jaworski. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski and the host of Heart to Heart with Anna. We are in Season 9 and our theme this season is Advancements in Congenital Heart Disease. Our show today is Stem Cells for an HLHS Heart and our guest is Jennifer Gutman. Jennifer Gutman is the mother of Lucas, who is a hypoplastic left heart syndrome or HLHS survivor and the sister of Jared Constein, who passed away 30 years ago from HLHS. Lucas is taking part in a special program at Mayo Clinic where stem cells taken from umbilical cord blood were injected into his right ventricle during the Glenn procedure. Lucas was diagnosed with HLHS in utero. When Lucas was born, his parents banked his umbilical cord. Lucas was a good candidate for the new program, so both parents and Lucas's older brother, Jacob, all had echocardiograms. Jennifer and her husband, Brian, gave blood and tissue samples for research. No one in Lucas's immediate family had an undiagnosed congenital heart defect. Lucas is 12 months post-Glenn. At his last cardiology appointment, his cardiologist exclaimed, This is the best right ventricle I've ever seen. I'm going to have all my patients get stem cells. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Jennifer. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Well, I am so happy to see that nobody in Lucas's immediate family, meaning not you, your husband, or your other son, have any undiagnosed congenital heart defects. It must have been a relief to you to see that you didn't have a problem that was undiagnosed. Absolutely. I was very nervous getting those tests done and very relieved to hear that there was no other concerns. Yeah, I am so sorry to see that your brother passed away from HLHS. Was he older or younger than you? He was a little bit older than me. I was born after he passed. Oh, my goodness. So you never got to meet him? No, I did not. He survived his Norwood surgery, which was very experimental at the time. In fact, insurance wouldn't even pay for it. So the doctor donated his time to attempt the surgery. And he came through the Norwood. He did have a cardiac arrest, but he was brought back. And he ended up getting an infection and passed away from that a couple weeks later. Oh, no. It was an infection that got him? Yes. It was just one of those things being in the hospital. We all know that infections are definitely possible. And you get the worst bugs, the most resistant, nastiest bugs possible come from the hospital. Mm -hmm. Your poor mother, she must have been devastated. Was she already pregnant with you? No, no, she wasn't. I happened a year or so later. (laughs) Okay, so that was a huge leap of faith on your parents' part to decide to have another child after already losing one. At the time, it was not known that there was a genetic component of HLHS, and the doctor assured her, you have other healthy children, you should do what your heart feels you need to do. Okay, so you have other older siblings then? Yes, I have three other older siblings. Oh, wow. And none of them had any heart problems at all? Not that we're aware of. Wow. Well, and I think you'd be aware of that by now, don't you? (laughs) Hopefully, yeah. (laughs) Wow. So what year was your brother born? It would have been 1985, I believe. Yeah, it definitely was still considered experimental way back then. Wow. Did Mm -hmm. he go to the hospital Dr. Norwood was at? Let's see, in 85, he would have been either at Boston or at CHOP. Unfortunately not. They weren't aware of his condition or what the problem was with him. And they were in a more rural hospital. And they sent him to Fort Wayne, Indiana. And they sent him to Toledo, uh, Toledo Children's. And Dr. Davis performed the operation there. They no longer do these type of procedures at Toledo. Yeah, there aren't as many facilities doing it as we heart parents would like. Wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Everybody wants it to be close to home, but 
sometimes you just have to travel a little bit. And luckily, we were close by to a lot of very good heart centers where we live now. Yes, yes, that is quite fortunate. How did losing a brother to HLHS affect you as you were growing up? I didn't fully understand what it meant to be born with half of a heart. It was something I never completely understood. Mm-hmm. It was hard during, you know, around his birthday and special occasions that I could see in my parents' eyes that they were missing a part of the family. But I always thought that it wasn't genetic. So I remember when I went in for an ultrasound for my first child, I asked about HLHS. And the tech said, oh, no, that's not genetic. You don't have anything to worry about. And that child was born healthy. So I dismissed it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, in the next segment, we're going to talk more about the program at the Mayo Clinic. But before we take a quick break, how did you find out that your unborn child would be born with HLHS? And how did you react to that news? We found out during the routine ultrasound at 22 weeks to find out the gender. And it was going very well until the tech became very silent. And I just knew something was wrong. So I pressured her and she was very certain what she was seeing, that it was HLHS. And of course, my world shattered and I cried for longer than I ever thought possible because I was so worried that it was a death sentence. Mm-hmm. And I, well, sure. I couldn't understand how history was repeating itself. Mm-hmm. With your firstborn, did you have an ultrasound? And were you worried about him possibly having a heart defect? I was, but they did tell me at the time, the person who was doing the ultrasound, that was in 2012 with my firstborn, they said that HLHS and heart defects are not genetic, that there's no risk of him getting that. So I never believed that something like this would happen. Mm -hmm. But a few years later, a lot of research has been done, and everybody's learned a lot about CHDs and the fact that they can be genetic. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different world. It sure is. I noticed that with my two children, too. I have two sons, also born three years apart. And luckily for us, it was my second son who was born with a congenital heart defect. Because if it had been the first child, they weren't doing as many Norwoods in Texas. Wow. In fact, I don't think there was anybody who was really doing it when my first son was born. And so we got lucky that, and you don't feel like you're lucky that your child was born with a heart defect, but if a child had to be born with a heart defect, if a child was to be born with a heart defect in my family, I'm lucky it was my second born son because in that three year period, Dr. John Calhoun had gone to study with Dr. Norwood and came back to Texas and was doing a Norwood procedure in San Antonio. So you're right. Three years can make a big difference. And it certainly has made a big difference in our understanding about the genetic component. No question about it. Well, we need to take a quick break. But thank you for sharing what you have so far. Don't leave yet, listeners, because when we come back, Jennifer will talk about how she found out about the stem cell program at the Mayo Clinic and why Luke has had surgery at two different hospitals. We'll be back after this brief commercial break. The most common theme that I hear is why. She always needed um, a lot of attention. She had strokes. Even though it's a natural inclination to withdraw from the CHD community, I think being a part of it helped me be part of the solution. Heart to Heart with Michael. Please join us every Thursday at noon Eastern. I'm Michael Lieben, and I'll be your host as we talk with people from around the world who have experienced those most difficult moments. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect, or CHD, community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. 
Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today's show is Stem Cells for an HLHS Heart, and our guest is Jennifer Gutman. We've been talking with Jennifer about having lost a brother to hypoplastic left heart syndrome, or HLHS, and then discovering her unborn son would also be born with HLHS. So Jennifer, before the break, we were talking about how you discovered Lucas would be born with HLHS. I'm kind of surprised they didn't pick up on it until 22 weeks. So tell me how you found out really at that late stage about the stem cell program. Well, lucky for me, I have an amazingly smart and talented sister-in-law who is a doctor. So when she found out about Lucas being diagnosed with HLHS, She uh, did a lot of research and reaching out to different hospitals and doctors, and she really worked hard for us to help us get the best outcome for Lucas. And she actually called Dr. Nelson at the Mayo Clinic and discussed things in doctor's terms that maybe some of us don't quite fully understand, but um, she was really great at helping explain the process and giving me her opinion on it, and she was very much in favor of us doing this. So I spoke with Dr. Nelson, and he really made a strong case, and I trusted him because he just sounded so genuine and honest, and he seemed like the kind of guy that's just doing it for all of the right reasons. That's the impression I get, too. Yeah, I just talked with a gentleman who called into my live show mm-hmm. this last week, and he works with Dr. Nelson and was saying the exact same thing, oh, that he is a very caring, loving doctor, and that he has some slots open for parents to call in, and he'll consult with the parents even before the child is a patient mm-hmm. to try and answer their questions and make them feel at ease. So it sounds to me like he did a great job. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's a very new thing, but the risks were minimal from what we understood. There weren't a lot of risks, but there was a whole lot to gain. We did a lot of reading on our own, just searching mm-hmm. the Internet, looking at different countries, what they're doing with stem cells, and everything was just so promising. We had to at least give Lucas this chance. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I wish we had known about this when my son was born. It seems like science fiction. It does. It just seems almost impossible that they can do this from cord blood. I just am astounded. So when the caller called into my program this last week, he was saying that the Karen and Todd Wanick Foundation are actually willing to pay for some people to have the cord blood extracted and then processed. And I guess you have to put it in a storage facility until it's time to use it. Is that foundation the one that helped you as well? Or did you do it all on your own? No, they walked us through every single step of it. Karen, who works with Dr. Nelson, is kind of the go-to woman. She walked us through every step. So they FedExed us the box containing all the directions for the sampling and everything like that. So we just took it with us when we went to deliver and they messengered it all the way back to Minnesota. Oh, wow. And (laughs) there's a lot writing on whether or not you're a good candidate. I know that if you've had certain complications post Norwood, they don't consider you to be a good candidate for this trial at this time. I know that there's other trials happening that occur later on where you can use different types of stem cells and do it later on in life. Oh, wow. That's good to know that it's not just dependent on having that cord blood. That's really good to know. Right. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you never felt like you were all alone in going through this. No, they were so easy to get a hold of and so open and willing to help and explain. I think Karen even gave me her cell phone number. So everything went pretty smoothly with the collection. It was was all a matter of waiting until they could review Luke's records and see how he did post-Norwood and if he would be a good candidate. Okay, okay. So why did he have his first surgery at Mott Children's Hospital instead of at the Mayo Clinic? We live in north central Ohio, and Mott Children's is about an hour and 45 minutes away, and it's a lot farther to Mayo Clinic. Sure. And Mott Children's was fantastic, too. I've Nothing negative to say about them. They were wonderful to us. Mm -hmm. 
but they did not offer the same opportunity. So that's why we went to Mayo Clinic. Okay, that makes sense. Yes, Mott Children's is very well known for Dr. Edward Beauvais being there. Oh, yeah. And he's been called the man with the golden hands. And he is, yes. <laughs> he is such a loving and dear man. When I approached him, I think it was like 15 years ago now. That's hard to believe. But when I approached him over a decade ago and told him that I was putting together a book, it was to be called The Heart of a Mother, and I asked him if he would write the foreword, he was just so sweet about it. And he actually did write the foreword for my book. So I have the utmost respect for him. And then I was lucky enough to later attend a conference where he was a speaker. He was so wonderful about the way he talked to the doctors and what he said about the parents and how he said we were all part of the same team. I mean, he was just fabulous. Mm -hmm. I absolutely loved listening to him. I could have listened to him for hours on end. So, Oh, we love him. He saved Lucas's life. He mm-hmm. he did Luke's first surgery, so oh, he'll you actually always had have a special Dr. place in our heart. Oh my gosh, you actually <laughs> yeah. had the Dr. Bavay to do the his Dr. surgery. Bovet. Oh my gosh, yes, that's a yep. huge blessing. That's a huge blessing. Well, so that makes yes. sense then that the first surgery, which wasn't going to be using the stem cells, could be done at your. I won't say local because an hour away is not local, but at the closer hospital. But then right. he was deemed to be a good candidate for the stem cell program. Is that correct? Yes. And so that's why he had the second surgery at the Mayo Clinic. Right. Okay. Has it been difficult dealing with two different hospitals? I mean, as far as insurance, anyway, I can imagine it would be a nightmare. Well, and our cardiologist is at Toledo Hospital. (laughs) And we also go to Cincinnati for some things. Oh, my god! Yeah, there's some juggling. (laughs) There's some juggling. Insurance is interesting. I'm sure they hate us. <laughs> oh, so how do you keep it all straight? I try to keep everybody in the loop as best I can with appointments. I try to be pretty thorough. It looks like we're going to be going to Cincinnati Children's for his third surgery because his heart has done really well with all the surgeries. It's his airway that's been the issue because he has paralyzed vocal cords oh. and his ENT doctor is in Cincinnati, so we'll be going there for the third. Oh, wow. My son ended up with paralyzed vocal cords after his second surgery. Really? Yes, and his diaphragm was partially paralyzed, and that was a whole other issue to have to deal with. We had to lug oxygen around with us everywhere until his diaphragm healed, and they told me that his diaphragm might never heal, and they also said his vocal cords might never heal. But we got really, really lucky. And my background is in speech pathology. So like it or not, he had therapy all day, every day. (laughs) (laughs) I bet he did. (laughs) Well, it was just play therapy. And like you, I have a son who's older. Mm -hmm. And of course, Joey was my best assistant ever. Everything that Joey did, Alex wanted Mm -hmm. to do. And so it was very natural. It didn't feel like therapy because it was just normal play stuff. But Thankfully, thanks to Our Lady at the Lake University and the University of Texas at Austin providing such good training for me in the area of speech pathology, I was able to help Alex. And now he's 22 years old and his voice is a little different than a traditional Mm -hmm. 22-year-old who hasn't ever had open heart surgery because his vocal cords were damaged again in the third surgery. Oh, geez. I know. Like, he hasn't had enough to deal with. (laughs) Yeah. But it was much less severe the last time that he had surgery, and so he came back from it faster, but still, it took a whole year before his voice was Mm -hmm. really back to normal. So do you have hope that Lucas's voice will come back, or what have they told you? He can can talk. It's just the breathing that's the issue. Um, So far, so good. But we want his ENT to intubate him. Mm Mm-hmm because he's familiar with his vocal cords and his, you know, his specific anatomy. So in Cincinnati, of course, has a great heart center as well. They do. We're concerned, but we are also considering vocal cord surgery. But for now, we're just kind of holding off because he seems to be doing okay. Well, if you end up having that surgery, contact me again, Jennifer, because I have a friend who is also a heart patient who, like our boys, suffered from vocal cord damage, and he had the surgery, and he has nothing but good things to say about it. So if you do go that way, let me know, and I'll hook you up with that. 
young man. That would be awesome. Yeah, I think it helps when you can talk to somebody who's already been there and experienced it. Oh, yeah. We're out of time again already. This has gone really okay. fast, Jennifer. <laughs> so we're going to take a quick commercial break, but don't leave yet, friends, because when we come back, we're going to talk to Jennifer about what advice she has for families who are interested in the benefits of stem cell procedures. We'll be right back. When I saw so many of these CHG groups growing, I found family just ready to join me. Anyone who is a member of the adult congenital heart defect community can be a guest on our show. We have a great year planned and we look forward to sharing other interesting topics. Heart to Heart with Nicole and David, serving the ACHD community, Wednesdays at noon Eastern. Anna Jaworski has spoken around the world at congenital heart defect events and she is available as a keynote or guest speaker for your event. Go to hearttoheartwithanna.com to learn more about booking Anna for your event. You can also find out more about the radio program. Keep up to date with CHD resources and information about advocacy groups, as well as read Anna's weekly blog. Anna wants you to stay well-connected and participate in the CHD community. Visit hearttoheartwithanna.com today. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today's show is Stem Cells for NHLHS Heart, and our guest is Jennifer Gutman. We have been talking to Jennifer about how her son was taken into a wonderful program at the Mayo Clinic where stem cells were used to help grow his right ventricle, which to me, this is just totally amazing. So we're going to talk to Jennifer right now about what advice she has for others. So I'm sure, Jennifer, that whenever you talk about your son's surgery to people in the CHD community, they want to know more. So would you tell us what advice you have for a family that has just discovered their unborn child will be born with HLHS? I would definitely say, get some books, read, read, read. We bought a ton of books and studied HLHS. We Googled, we talked to many different doctors to get different opinions. Again, lucky for me, my sister-in-law is a doctor, so she had some contacts she could uh, use to help us. Mm -hmm. We wanted to know everything about this that we possibly could so we could be prepared in the hospital and when we brought him home. I think the online Facebook groups are great, but don't get wrapped up in all of the negative stories. Focus on how many people are doing really well with this and are living great lives. Talk to some adult HLHSers that have fantastic lives, and they're such an inspiration for all of us. Mm -hmm. If you know that you're going to have a baby with HLHS, I would definitely look into banking the umbilical cord blood with Mayo Clinic. Hopefully your child's a candidate. If not, who knows what's going to happen a few years from now because things are changing so rapidly and they're devoting so much into helping these kids live longer and healthier lives. Right. So don't just don't ever give up. I love that advice. And I think you're brilliant to say, go ahead and bank the umbilical cord blood, whether or not you're going to take part in this program or not, because we don't know what might happen in the future, but you only have one shot to bank that umbilical cord blood. Absolutely. Now, my caller from last week let me know that the Todd and Karen Wanick Foundation is actually paying to help with the harvesting and the storing of the umbilical cord blood. So let's go ahead and let people know about that program. It's at the Mayo Clinic. And so if you are interested in getting more information, you can write to them at hlhs at mayo.edu. And Dr. Nelson is willing to give second opinions or do consultations with people during the week. He has eight slots open. So if you would like to talk to Dr. Nelson, then you can send him an email at that same address or just go online and get the phone number and call him or listen to my Heart to Heart with Anna live week eight program and you can get the phone numbers and contact information there. There's several different ways that you can get that information. So if you had to do it all over again, Jennifer, what would you do differently? And what would you not change? That's a really tough question because 
everything that happens seems to happen for a reason. And sometimes we don't know what that reason is. And sometimes we find out later on, I, I don't know that I would change anything. I feel like everything we've done for him has been from our hearts, you know, in our opinion, that in his best interest. Mm-hmm. I think he is as strong as he is today because of these stem cells. Mm. That's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. So what is the best advice that you can offer parents of any child who's about to be born with a congenital heart defect? I would have to say to keep your head up, pray, research, get involved with the community. You can learn so much by getting involved with different organizations. Sisters by Heart is a wonderful organization. The NPCQIC was a great, great experience. It was a conference we went to in Cincinnati about quality improvement for HLHS. Be as involved as you can possibly be because it will only benefit your child. Be your child's advocate and just stay strong and know that you know, you're doing the best that you can. Yes, I wish Sisters by Heart had been around when my son was diagnosed. For those of you who don't know, Sisters by Heart was started by some HLHS moms, and they realize that all of us HLHS moms, we are sisters. And I feel like that with you, Jennifer, even though I've just been getting to know you recently, I feel a very special bond with you. And so the Sisters by Heart are specifically for HLHS families, and they have a wonderful website. They have a Facebook group. They're very proactive. They do so much to empower members of the HLHS community. It really is inspiring to me what these women have been able to do. And I've heard some of the founders of that program speak at different conferences. They're all so smart and very articulate. Oh, they're wonderful. I know, they're just wonderful. I wish they had been around when my kid was first diagnosed. So I think you're right. Reaching out to some of those organizations is very helpful. And I also like what you said, focus on the positive things that you can learn on Facebook because there will always be some people who don't have as good an outcome as you do. And there will be people who have a fabulous outcome too. So focus on the people who are doing well, not that you can't provide support and encouragement to those who are having a tough time, but especially when you're first diagnosed, you want to surround yourself with as many positive people as possible. Absolutely. I just think that's really, really important. I feel that, like you said, we're all here for a reason. And I think that even the difficult times that we do go through, we go through for a reason. I think it toughens us up. Don't you, Jennifer? I really believe that we're all here for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I think those difficult times make us stronger. I feel like I'm a much better advocate for my sons because of what I've gone through than if everything had always been perfect. Because life's not perfect. Absolutely. You'll never you'll never see the sunshine if you haven't felt the rain. Exactly. Oh, I love that. Well, I cannot believe it, but our time is already up. Can you believe 30 minutes has gone by that quickly, Jennifer? It was pretty fast. (laughs) It was. I'm so thankful that you came on the show and that you're starting off season nine for me. I think this is fabulous. Well, thanks for having me on, Anna. Well, thank you. And I hope to have you on the show again in the future where you can give us an update on how Lucas is doing. Absolutely. Well, that does conclude this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thanks for listening today. Please check out our website, www.hearttoheartwithanna.com. We are so lucky to live at a time in history where we can share information like this with others, even though we're not doctors. I just think this is great that two heart moms can talk about this kind of information and empower others in our community. So remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you've been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time. We'll talk again next week.